Today we're going to do some key historical background regarding the United Kingdom. The purpose for this video is to try to condense the most important things that you'll be required to master for both the AP exam as well as for the unit exam. My hope is to try to give you a greater understanding of what you were required to know because there's a lot of information in the book. Let's start off with early political development of the United Kingdom. It's important when understanding the UK to understand the term gradualism. It's a key term used to describe the historical development of the British Parliament and their democracy. The United Kingdom developed a democratic system gradually because of its geographic isolation from the rest of Europe. The UK had a slow process of removing power from the monarchy and giving power to elected officials. The most important sort of start of this step process is the Magna Carta, which I'm going to get to. But it's important to understand that unlike some other countries in Europe, there wasn't like a big revolution and then all of a sudden after that a democracy was put into power. That gradually over time the monarchy lost power and the citizens gained power. Common law is an important term um, that you must understand in understanding like how politics developed in the UK. It's a system based on local customs and precedent rather than on formal legal codes. Because of the UK's dependence on common law, it also makes sense then why they have such a differently constructed legal branch, um, judicial branch, which we'll talk about later on in the unit. The UK is no formal like no official written constitution. Instead, they use a series of procedures, treaties, and acts of parliament that work together to be this unofficial constitution. And this unofficial constitution really dates back to 1215 with the Magna Carta, which began to take away the monarch's powers. The Magna Carta is a unique document because it's really as far as I'm able to understand, the first time that a civilization formally limited the power of their king. Um, and it really sort of creates this concept of limited government. It declared that even the king has to obey the law, and it gave people the right to a trial with a jury of their peers. The English Bill of Rights, which your book doesn't talk about in the same way, but is also considered also part of this sort of set of founding documents. The English Bill of Rights is from 1689, and it's seen as another key document. It promised free elections. It gave rights to the accused. It guaranteed free speech and protection from cruel and unusual punishment. Both of these two documents, the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, gave three key ideas that have influenced our government. They gave the ideas of representative government, limited government, and individual rights. We really see some of these ideas directly in the U.S. Constitution. And while that's not important for understanding the AP comparative exam, I think it's important, one, because we're going to work on the skill of compar comparing in this unit, and we're going to compare the U.K. with the U.S., but also I think it's important to understand this because we live in the United States, and it's important to understand where these ideas come from. Over time, the British monarchy lost more and more power, and by the late 18th century, prime ministers were appointed by the parliament, and monarchs lost the power to select members of the government. And so we've seen that full gradual transition happen then by the, by the late 18th century, and that the UK had a democracy as opposed to a monarchy. And the monarchs really at that point are more of a figurehead. So the UK Constitution, it's in, this is an important AP tip. A recent AP free response question asked students to describe three proposed changes to the United Kingdom's constitution. And that could trip people up because you could be like, wait a minute, they don't have a constitution. And they don't have a formal constitution, but that doesn't mean they don't have a constitution. They have what's called an unwritten constitution, which is unusual. Okay, These are a series of acts of parliament that make up the UK's unwritten constitution. And it's called this because it's actually easy to change and because... The laws um, that are supposedly a part of this constitution are actually debatable. Okay, um, Since the parliament itself is viewed as sovereign, the lower house, which is democratically elected, can amend any aspect of the constitution by a simple majority vote. That's obviously very different from the process we use in the United States. And this makes the United Kingdom an unusual democracy and that it doesn't have a formal constitution and that it is actually relatively easy to amend their unwritten constitution. Your textbook talks about the constitutional reform movement and there are two recent constitutional changes that you should know. 
One is that the British Parliament has devolved. Some powers, devolved means to give away, some powers to Scotland and Wales. So even though the UK is a unitary system, right, meaning that the national government really controls most of the decisions, um, it has given some powers to the regional governments. However, that is not the same as saying that the UK is a federal system like the United States. But that change, that devolution of powers to Scotland and Wales, that is a recent constitutional change. Second, another one that your book talks about is the number of members of the House of Lords has been reduced. That is another constitutional change. There have been other proposed changes, like one that some books give is this idea of having the UK join the Euro, which there was some discussion of putting that on the ballot and having that as a referendum. But obviously that point is completely moot since this summer um, the UK voted by referendum that they don't even want to be a part of the EU. Another one that the books talk about is that there was a referendum on changing the cons unwritten constitution and having um, people elected to the parliament based on proportional representation, and that proposed that proposal failed. But it's important to understand not only where the UK constitution comes from, but what even comprises this unwritten constitution and the difference between a formal constitution and unwritten constitution. The next I want to talk about some key history post-World War II, okay? And I wouldn't say that there are responsibilities you have to know in terms of going as far back as Winston Churchill, who's featured in the picture, in terms of knowing about famous British prime ministers. But I would say that it's important for you to know about Margaret Thatcher, who I'm going to talk about, and Tony Blair. Post-World War II, there is a unique period in British history that's referred to as the collectivist consensus. There was great unity post-World War II, which led to the creation of the British welfare state. It is really important that you understand this British welfare state. The idea was that the, the government was responsible for taking care of the needs of the citizens, and that included things like providing universal health care for people, um, trying to give as many people jobs as possible, you know, really sort of expanding the role of government in terms of taking care of people. The most important part of the welfare state that was created in this collectivist con consensus period was the National Health Service, the NHS, and it to this day remains an incredibly popular government program that even when the pendulum has swung the other direction, which I'm going to talk about, and where the welfare state has been attacked, this program, the National Health Service, has been protected because it is incredibly popular. During the collectivist consensus period, even though it was a Labour Party program, it's important to understand that British Conservatives also supported this program. <clears throat> but that changes in the 1970s with the election of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher um, shares the unique distinction of being the first female Prime Minister and is really looked to as being one of the first women ever to be a leader of an industrialized democracy. But also uniquely, she was the first leader of an industrialized democracy to experiment with neoliberal economic policies. What, what you mean by neoliberal economic policies? Normally you hear that term referred to developing countries or um, countries in the global south that like the World Bank or the IMF say that these countries have to use neoliberal economic policies. But really what's unique about Margaret Thatcher, and you have to think about her as a contemporary with Ronald Reagan, she was proposing that actually the way to deal with the economic crisis that was happening in Great Britain in the 1970s was she said we have to stop spending so much money on this bloated welfare state. She actually called it the nanny state. And so she broke with this tradition of conservative or Tory support for the welfare state and really tried to turn um, turn this around. And so what she did is she did, um, she promoted privatization, which means the selling off of government owned industries into private hands. One key industry which she privatized was the railroads. She also lowered taxes. She cut costly social spending. And she replaced some social services, like in housing and mass transit, with private enterprise and really tried to change the role of the government as not being as responsible for taking care of all of these aspects of um, of British citizens and their needs, and her government officially ended the post-war collectivist consensus period. 
um, collectivist consensus. It's important to note that even though, you know, the National Health Service, you might perceive that that would be something that would also be under attack during, th during the Thatcher period, the fact is, is that it was never in jeopardy because of its popularity. The New Labor Party comes to power in 1997. Um, some of Thatcher's ideas are re rejected by the voters and sort of like the pendulum then swings back towards the center as opposed to from the right. So the idea would be during collectivist consensus it swung to the left, then during Thatcher it swung to the right, and then during the New Labour Party era that starts in 1997 it swings more towards the middle. Prime Minister Tony Blair um, tries to rebrand the party. He talks about the third way and he tries to put forward the centrist program that is in, in the middle between Thatcher's laissez-faire economic policies and Labor's more traditional program of an elaborate welfare state. And you sort of see with that um, that there's sort of different periods. But it's important that in all of these periods, you know, England has much more of a welfare state than we've ever had in the United States. And so really we're just talking about sort of like degrees of which the UK has had a labor has had a welfare state post World War II, and then the New Labour Party um, held power for thirteen years. I think the last sort of bit of key history that deals with Parliament and the different parties that's important for you to understand is that. This idea of the 2010 parliamentary elections I see pop up in lots of AP questions. And that's because in 2010, the parliamentary election resulted in a hung parliament. That's an important term. In a hung parliament, no party obtains a majority of the seats. Prime Minister David Cameron forms a coalition government between the conservatives and the center-left liberal Democrats, um, calling for fairness, freedom, and responsibility. And it is seen as a nod to both Thatcher and Blair as sort of a way to try to combine these different sort of um, popular policies from the past. In your book, it also talks about the history with Northern Ireland. I think it's, imp and, but I'm putting in the history section, but different books put it in sort of the, the terrorism section, different books put it in the, you know, public policy section. It goes in a variety of different places, but I'm putting it in this history section. Religion has um, historically been an issue of conflict in Northern Ireland. The majority of the people that live there are Protestant, 60%, but about 40% are Catholic. This religious divide was compounded by both national and class differences, and Catholics were frequently discriminated against in issues of employment and education. There's a period that's referred to by the British as the Troubles that begins in, 19, in the 1960s. In the 1960s, um, some people in Northern Ireland formed the Irish Republican Army, which is also referred to as the IRA, and they used violence against British targets, both in Northern Ireland but also in England, um, in, the in, the, in the hopes of joining Northern Ireland with the Republic of Ireland. And if you think about that map, right, Northern Ireland is separate from England, Scotland, and Wales. It's on a different island, and so it shares an, it's on the same island with the Republic of Ireland, but it's actually a part of a different country, right? And so their demand was that they wanted the, um, the Isle of Ireland to be united as one island. Um, nearly 4,000 people died in the conflict. Um, it ends officially with the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. And the Good Friday Agreement allowed for the reestablishment of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Now Northern Ireland has some aspects of self-rule, similar to how Scotland and Wales also have some aspects of self-rule. And now former members of the IRA run for political office under the banner of the party of Sinn Féin. Um, I think it's important to understand the situation in Northern Ireland. One, because this idea of how England, I'm sorry, how the UK is a unitary system, but has devolved powers to some of its member regional governments is a theme that comes up on the exam, and so Northern Ireland would be an example of that. But also recent AP um, FRAQ questions have asked students to compare the United Kingdom and Nigeria's responses to domestic terrorism. And so... Um, Although the situation of domestic terror terrorism would be 
more historical for England and it's more current in terms of Nigeria. I wanted to plant that seed because then when we go talk later on in the semester, later on the trimester about Boko Haram, that's an opportunity to be able to make that comparison. So my hope is that this um, introductory video will give you some of the information that you need. After you've watched this video, I would like you to answer the multiple choice questions that are examples of what you would need to know for the AP exam or for the unit exam, and they are on the bottom of this Google form. Thank you.